Good morning, everybody. So we are waiting for like uh, another five minutes for other people to join here in person, and then we start. Thank you. Okay, I think we can start. Uh, the first one is Antonio Stamera. Please, if you can share your presentation. Hi, yes, I can. I think I can. I'm sharing it now the window and I'm now it should be full screen. Can you confirm that? Yeah, perfect. And so is the, it moving? Yeah, so just a little bit of a quick introduction. Uh, Antonio Stamera is going to talk to us about uh, GT CTA and extragalactic and transient sign cases. Please go ahead. You have uh, 15 minutes about and uh, a few minutes for questions. Yes. So first, thanks uh, for your invitation really to this uh, thriving uh, collaboration in LSST, many activities 
and ongoing. Now, I, I will present now uh, for the synergies uh, session, uh, the case of CTA, and then after me, uh, Emma and Catherine will, will complement uh, the few, few very small bits of, of, uh, the, of uh, introduction to CTA. Now, what uh, CTA is, uh, this is just something pedagogical. It is a cherry of telescope. What does it mean? It means that it de detects uh, the gamma rays from, from above the sky that interact in the atmosphere, uh, producing a shower of particles. Each particle is a, 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 a luminal uh, a particle, so it produces a, a flash of cherry of light, as you can see in this uh, small movie. And this uh, cherry of light is uh, detected by the telescope. So why I'm saying this, uh, probably all of you already know, but can you hear me? Yeah. So all, all of you prob probably already know is uh, uh, the, 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 the telescope are just the final part of the development of the shower in the atmosphere. So the real instrument is the atmosphere plus uh, the telescopes. And this is important to understand one of the main points. This is also of interest for what I'm going to discuss about transients and uh, extragalactic sources, which is the big effective area. Uh, uh, because the telescope is not, the effective area is not limited by the telescope, but is limited by the area of the sharing of light, uh, which is uh, uh, on the ground and which is sampled by the telescopes. Uh, the typical energy range is uh, from a few tens of GV up to uh, more than 100 TV and uh, more on the specific uh, uh, performance will be provided uh, later. But just to a uh, comparison with the typical direct detection detector out of the atmosphere as Fermilat, uh, this gives uh, a, a comparison on, on, the on, the, on the site. And the, the telescope, what do the telescope do? They detect the, the image of the, of the uh, shower on the atmosphere as these uh, small uh, ellipsoids. And through them, we can detect and reconstruct the uh, properties of the primary gamma rays. So uh, starting from this technique that uh, was first introduced in, in the 90s, uh, we have up to now detected something like a few hundred of sources. You, you see here the, the sky map, the galactocentric sky map, and the sources detected up to now, which are of the order of 250. And they are uh, uh, divided in, in different kinds of sources from galactic sources on the plane, as you can see. Uh, and the specifically, the most the majority of the extra galactic sources are dominated by, by AGN and specifically by blazers. So uh, AGN with the jets, uh, radio, radio galaxies, or AGN with the jets, uh, with the jet pointing directly to us. And the very last uh, entry of, of our uh, catalog are the gamma ray bars, uh, as I will show you later. So what is CTA? CTA is, first of all, is an observatory, is a gamma ray observatory. Is the first gamma ray observatory because up to now, usually telescopes uh, work as experiments. Uh, they were all proprietary of the data. Now as an observatory, the data will be provided also to external guest observers. As an observatory, uh, it, it, it's, it's a bit of a different observatory as optical ones, of course. And they are, for example, the typical, they are, have three different sizes of telescopes, a small size, a medium size, and, uh, and large uh, size telescopes uh, from, uh, let's say, four meters of diameter up to 23 meters diameters. And the reason to have that is to provide a, a, a wide, uh, uh, leverage a wide uh, 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 range in, in energies. And this is because, as I, I told you, the telescopes are sampling the shower on the ground, the chunk of light on the ground from the, the gamma ray shower. The, the CTA will be formed by two main uh, arrays, one on the north and one on the south. The array on the north is, uh, is uh, will have uh, large and medium telescopes, not small size telescopes. There are two different uh, configuration, uh, alpha and omega. So, so they are called the alpha is the one that will be implemented soon and the omega is, let's say, the asymptotic uh, uh, configuration that we will try to reach uh, if uh, we have enough funding in the future. In the south, uh, the, the, the telescopes are uh, 
uh, are mainly uh, medium size and uh, small size telescopes. Uh, and so uh, you, you uh, okay. And actually recently, very recently, there was a, 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 an exceptional funding in Italy due to the so-called National Resilience and uh, Recovery uh, Plan that allowed us to submit a, a proposal that will allow us to build two large telescopes. So it will, the Southern Array will be the complete array with the small, large, small and, uh, and medium telescopes. And uh, already now, already in the alpha configuration, which I think is, is an important asset for the CTA. On the right, you have a box with some uh, key figures uh, for, the, uh, for the CTA, but I will go somehow in more detail in, in the next uh, uh, slides. Now, first, what kind of science will CTA do? Uh, in, in planning the science, uh, we, we found three main themes. Uh, the first one is more related to the so-called astroparticle uh, physics, so mainly to uh, cosmic rays studies, so to find the, the sources where uh, cosmic rays are accelerated, how do they propagate in the galaxy and up to us, and uh, how, the, how it is the impact in the, uh, in the environment where they are produced. There is a second theme, which is more, let let me say, astrophysical, which is related to the uh, un to understanding the the properties of the sources emitting gamma rays. Uh, and so, what happens in the in the, in the compact objects, uh, which is also galactic uh, pulsars or or uh, other uh, binary system, for example. What happens in AGNs? Uh, where we have, as we know, relativistic jets, but also winds and also flaring episodes and the cosmic voids because uh, gamma rays interacts in, uh, in their path from the source to us and they, they, uh, they bring the imprint of this interaction. And so they can, we can infer, uh, for example, EBL, extragalactic background light properties and the others, uh, I don't know, intergalactic magnetic field and so on and so forth. And finally, there is uh, the, the, the extreme exotic physics, uh, how it is usually called, which is the uh, study of dark matter of Lorentz invariance valuation. I remind you that dark matter, different kind of dark matter can have in print in the TV region, uh, according to present theories. Uh, and also, for example, to look for axon-like particles. And maybe you are knowledgeable about the recent GRB, uh, GRB 0, uh, 22, 10, and 09A, uh, that according to an experiment uh, detected a, a multi TV photons up to 20 TV. If true, probably not, let me say, but if true, this would be a, 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 a direct a direct indication of existence of axon-like particles, just to give you an idea of what does it mean gamma rays with, with uh, dark matter. Okay, how do we declinate all these different themes? Well, to do that, there is a consortium. CTA is an observatory. There is a, the observatory on one side. There is the, the consortium, which is a, a collaboration of many institutes that are also building the, the, the telescopes, but they are uh, supporting CTA observatory in, in, the, in the science. And they, what, they, what we did actually was uh, to prepare a, a, a paper, a science book uh, in the past with these uh, different themes uh, that I will not uh, for sure uh, describe all of them, but you can recognize uh, some of the themes that I've described to you. What I will do now, I will just give a very bit, few small bits of, uh, of, of what we do with the survey in the exagalactic sky and uh, also in the transient and on AGNs. For galactic sources, Emma uh, will will give the talk just after me. So let's let let me go back a bit on the performances, just understand how CTA can perform on these uh, sources. Uh, first of all, the field of view. Field of view is a bit strange idea. It's not a direct view of the sky as you understood from the shower. I hope. I mean, I, I was clear enough. And uh, but the idea is that we have a field of view of, of few degrees, uh, that is not uniform in the in the acceptance, but still, it's 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 quite a wide uh, uh, field of view that is comparable with LSST, for example. 
resolution, angular resolution is, is not the same as, as an optical telescope. It's of the order of 0, 0,1 or less, up to even less uh, 0, 0,1 degrees. So let's say arc minutes uh, or, or of the order of one arc minutes, depending also on the energy. But this will allow us, in any case, to uh, have a proper morphology studies on, on a few sources, for example, galactic sources, but also extended extra galactic sources, as you can see here from Centaurus A. The other key point for the performance is uh, the, the sensitivity. Now, in this plot, you can see uh, the, um, I don't know if, no, probably you do not see any 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 mouse. Uh, I'm sorry for that, but, uh, and I do not have any pointer, but okay. Uh, uh, you can see on the x-axis the energy, and on the y-axis you have the uh, minimal flux that can be detectable. Uh, so means detection means usually five sigma detection uh, in something like fifty hours. Now the plot is quite crowded. Just to make it a bit more clear, I show here. The, uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, a highlight of the uh, sensitivities of the present generation of telescopes and of the uh, CTA uh, uh, configuration in the alpha configuration. So the minimal, the one that will be built in the next uh, few years and for north and south. And you can see that there is a, something like of the order of 10 times increase in sensitivity, which means a reduction of 100 times in, in, in time observations, for example, which means uh, uh, to improve also the precision of our spectra and, and to improve also the detection of transient sources. All things that are important in synergy with LSST. And to make it more clear, you can see here in this plot the uh, striking difference of between the two instruments, Fermilat, which is the sky, uh, sorry, the space instrument detecting directly uh, gamma rays, and the CTA at the same energy of 20, something like 20 GV, so a threshold for both instruments. And uh, you can see that the sensitivity as a function of the time that you see here is, uh, has a big improvement with CTA. Thanks as I told you before, to the uh, big effective area. So which means that we have really uh, uh, the possibility to, uh, to measure uh, uh, spectra and also to detect a uh, fast flare. And this is actually what happened as a sort of example uh, from present uh, Cherenkov telescopes. Here is magic, but we have also an uh, example from Hess, for example. We have uh, the very first uh, uh, GRB detected uh, by Cherenkov instruments. And you can see here in the spectral energy distribution where you see the, the energy on the bottom from uh, X-ray up to gamma rays and the flux on the Y-axis as usual. And you can see how striking the, the reconstruction of the spectrum of the evolution of the spectrum of the GRB can be measured by a Cherenkov telescope. It, it was a bright, it was bright GRB, but not so exceptional as the last one that we had uh, uh, something like less than one month ago. But we had, uh, thanks to this observation, really key observations, for example, on the existence of a second component or also to probe the parameters of the uh, models that were used to describe this GRB. Also to be more, to go more in the details, you see here the, the light curve. It, this is a bit complex uh, uh, figure, I know, but just to give you an, ear, an idea, this is a light curve or at different wavelengths from very high energy X-ray, MEV, and optical and radio. And well, thanks to our observation, to the multi-wavelength observation, while before this uh, indication of a second component could be driven directly from gamma rays. Here we need the multi-wavelength observation and also optical observation, regular observation in time are key. And here you see that we could, uh, for example, disentangle to different environments. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, if the GRB was exploding, was exploding in, a, in a uniform medium or in a windy medium. And you see from the, the lines, the, uh, the continuum lines are the, the uh, homogeneous medium, the dotted lines are the 
the windy medium. And also we can uh, infer uh, differences, for example, the spectral uh, modeling. Here you see the dashed line in the gamma rays, uh, if it is only SSC or, or, or not. So if you need to add another component, there are clear differences that can be dry, driven by our observations together with multi-wavelength observations. So, and this is finally, just to give you an idea, in our uh, consortium and also in the observatory, I mean, the transient are a key, uh, are key is, is a key science, is part of the key science projects. And there are dedicated working groups that are updating the, the what we wrote in the science book that was written before the, the GRB were detected. And also there are ongoing studies on GRBs, on neutrino and gravitational wave follow-ups. Uh, here on, on the top uh, left, you see an example of a GRB at high redshift. And this is something difficult for Cherenkov telescopes because there is this absorption that I mentioned at the very beginning that uh, reduces the flux. Uh, so this is quite difficult, but we can go thanks to the low energy threshold uh, up to re high redshift. And also all this is possible thanks to the interaction, technically speaking, with the external observatory to uh, get their alerts and uh, send all, also our alerts on to the external. All of this will be explained in more detail by Catherine's in the, in the second talk after mine. So let's finish with the AGNs, with the extra galactic uh, sky in the gamma ray sky. And uh, well, maybe I, I do not need to go more much into the details, but just to give you an idea in this sketch that you see here, uh, we have when we have the uh, AGN, so uh, we have also jet emission where acceleration of particles take place, and we have no thermal emission uh, going out that can be of leptonic origin, hadronic origin, and all these can. Uh, bring information on, on, on the central engine in, 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 in the AGN. So how the jet was formed, where the emission happens, which is the distribution of particles that are formed and accelerated, which are the physical mechanism and interaction within the source. All these things can be definitely uh, be helped by the uh, gamma ray uh, emission in uh, in, uh, um, in uh, sorry, there is a, a telephone. I, uh, okay, I'm sorry for the interruption. So uh, all this is uh, will bring definitely to to derive all this information, this physical information. What is needed is is a, a regular uh, sampling of of the light curve, which are regular in uh, for AGNs and high precision. Uh, uh, spectra measurements. And uh, thanks also to LSST, we will be able to monitor in the optical together with the, with the uh, CTA, no, CTA, uh, something like 2000 known blazers to understand how they do behave. To do that, we have two main programs. One is a, a, a follow up, a monitoring of uh, a monitoring of, uh, of, of AGNs, of single AGNs. A monitoring of single agents. We have uh, with the consortium uh, a planned 15 sources to be followed. As you can see on on, on the bottom, there is a, a, a light curve, a simulated light curve of a fast. Actually, is a source that was detected, but probably with CTA we will detect uh, in uh, in greater detail. And on the right, you see the spectra that can be measured by CTA on these sources. As you can see already by eye, the level of precision in both uh, light curve and spectra. And of course, these are just few sources that were suggested by the consortium, but more can be observed, can be suggested in, uh, uh, in the guest program that will be part of, of CTA. Let me mention a paper by Raiteri et al. that uh, Raiteri wrote to, and uh, that we wrote in the, uh, a white book, in the white book that uh, uh, we mentioned the fact that the problem for LST, for LSST, uh, for the survey uh, uh, with the Vera Rubin telescope on uh, blazers is that they are bright sources, usually with a magnitude of the order 16, which they saturate after something like less than 15 seconds. So in this white book, we, we also 
suggested a different method or different smaller snapshots. And also, I don't know if there was some, some news regarding this point in, in LSST program. And also the fact that we need, since the spectra are moving, are not fixed, we also need a reference in the spectral measurements by a filter measurement by LSST. So, uh, uh, Finally, uh, let me also mention that for AGNs, we have an extra galactic survey that, uh, will, uh, that will be done with CTA. It is a survey of something like 10,000 degrees of the sky, so 25% of the sky, and uh, with something like 1,000 hours dedicated to this project. This is something to be, let's say, uh, uh, agreed with the CTA Observatory and to be uh, formally approved, but uh, we are working on, on making this uh, case uh, stronger. And uh, what would we expect looking at the log n, log s of, of, uh, that we know on, on uh, uh, blazers, AGNs, uh, and uh, specifically BLAC and flat spectrum radio quasars, as you can see in the plot in the bottom, the, as a function of the gamma ray flux uh, at a very high energy, you, have, you get the log n, log s, the number of sources that you expect. And from this very first estimation, real estimation, not real estimation, is uh, you expect something 100 sources in these uh, new sources in this uh, in this uh, region and uh, yes and the lsst will be definitely a uh, key and important to uh, identify new sources and also to search for fast flares because we do these are in quiescent mode but we do expect also to detect flaring sources during the the, the survey and this will also give us indication on the duty cycle of the sources, because this is a regular uh, survey. So I think I almost finished. Uh, I have this is the summary of, of what I really briefly described. I understand that it, I could not be uh, uh, omnicomprehensive and uh, I mean, uh, just give you some flesh, some bits of what we can do. But the important key points are that uh, as a, an observatory, CTA is open also to observation from guest observers and also to uh, um, uh, agreements with other observatories to cover and to observe simultaneously uh, the same sources like AGNs or also to monitor in transients. And uh, I, I hope I, I convinced you that uh, uh, CTA is, is an ideal instrument for transients to detect also fast flares and transients. And in general, that the, thanks to CTA and to the multi wavelength observations, so we can constrain the better the physical parameters of extragalactic sources and the radiation, me radiation mechanism. In general, I think that uh, the uh, uh, complementary observation of LSST with CTA are really important to build a multi-wavelength uh, uh, understanding of, uh, of uh, high and energetic sources in, in, in the sky and to monitoring during the time their uh, states and to build, of course, a multi-wavelength uh, spectral energy distribution. So that's all from my side. I'm open to question if there is any. Okay, thank you, Antonio. <laughs> so, if there are just a very quick question here in the room or on Zoom, okay. So, if there are no questions now, uh, we can continue on the Slack channel, and uh, let's thank the speaker again. Thanks to you. So yeah, I would like to ask the next speaker to share the presentation. That would be me. That would be me, right? Yeah, it's uh, Emma. Okay. And I need uh, Antonio to stop sharing, and I will share right away. Yeah, Antonio, if you can uh, stop sharing. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, can you see my screen? Can you hear me well? Uh, if you click there. Okay, perfect. Okay. So the next presentation is going to be by Emma de Onya Wilhelmi uh, on galactic synergies between the LSST Rubin and the Cherenkov Telescope Array. Okay.
Well, then again, thanks for inviting me to, to, to give this talk. And uh, I'm also thankful to, to Antonio because he gave a nice introduction of all GTA that I can skip and go directly to, to the synergies and to the galactic science and explain a bit more what's the, the galactic topics we're interested on and what do we think we can do together with LSD, with the LSSD um, um, observatory. This you've seen already this 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 slide, um, maybe a different version, and this is the three big topics in which we uh, have all the physics or we that we want to exploit, and this is the reason we actually did the the, the CTA the, uh, observatory, and um, I'm gonna I'm gonna basically focus in first um, and second for, uh, blocks and this is basically the cosmic par cosmic particle accelerator um, and the stream environment this is also neutron star everything that that needs um, um, uh, outflows to, to accelerate particles but if you and, and within these blocks I want to focus on on the synergies but if you want to know more about all the galactic topics we we we, we are investigating in CTA or we will investigate you can go to this link here and you can find, as Antonio said before, this is the, the book that we wrote, and you can find all the topics and all the expectations we have for galactic science. But then let me go back to, to what's galactic uh, science for us. Um, and basically, um, I thought we should maybe say, because we are in a different optical environment, just to say what is uh, cosmic rays, and, and what we actually do. So we, 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 we build CTA, we are building CTA to investigate cosmic rays. And cosmic rays is atronic and leptonic cosmic rays. And when I say, we say cosmic rays is basically relativistic particles accelerated to very, very high energies. So this is for example, example of a cosmic ray um, uh, spectrum that we detect on, on, on Earth. And then you see the energies are around 10 to the 10 to 10 to the, we say 10 to the 14, 13 electron volts. This is the range in which the, the, of the particles we are interested in. And then, of course, to reach these energies and to supersede the thermal heating, you basically need relativistic flows or efficient Fermi acceleration in supersonic shock. Um, it, it, so the particles are accelerated to this 10 to the 9 uh, electron volts. And you can put the same thing in, in this kind of plot. In here, I, I, I had the, the magnetization of, of, the, of the environment of the plasma in which particles are accelerator. And this is the shock Lorentz factor or the velocity of the particles. Okay? And this is the kind of sources that we see that emit in gamma rays. So that means that they accelerate to TV, TV particles. I can just take away the AGNs and GRBs that Antonio just mentioned, and then I end up with this, this kind of objects. And basically, you have this kind of two uh, accelerators in one side, you have pulsars, and the environment around pulsars is this uh, relativistic winds around it, um, either isolated or, in, or, in, or gravitationally bounded to a massive star. And then we also have explosion of supernova remnants and these um, supersonic winds uh, either isolated or in clusters, the star clusters, and also the, the, the smaller version like Novi and this kind of galactic transients. And this is basically the kind of gamma ray emission we expect for these guys. Uh, for some of them, we expect steady gamma ray emission. And in that case, what we want to get from our colleagues in a different wavelength or, or multi or, or messengers is access to database. So we have the information that we can build and we can understand what's going on in these steady sources. And I'm talking about pulse emission or modulated emission in binary systems, um, uh, deceleration of supernova remnants, relativistic winds in pulsar wind nebulae, or, or the shocks powered by winds in massive stars. This is on one side and the other side, we, we also are gonna investigate a lot of transitional behavior. And this implies not just NOVI and also another kind of X-ray galactic, uh, galactic transients like X-ray binaries or, or, or flares in gamma ray binaries. 
but we also expect to see if there's from sources which are in principle steady as the wind nebulae from pulsars. And then this, this is something that we've seen in, in the GD regime and we expect to detect. And there is, there is of course, the unknown and everything that we expect to, to, to unveil by the in, by increasing the sensitivity to transient objects, as Antonio showed in the in the previous talk. So um, I just want to say a couple of things. So the spectral energy distribution to just show the gamma ray. Uh, how is the gamma ray uh, emission that we observe from, produced? And basically, it, it goes through two channels in the um, in the TV regime, which is talking is here in this. I guess you can see my mouse. I hope so. Okay, I yes. assume you were. Yes. Okay, okay, thank you. So basically, you have uh, here what I plot is the kind of uh, radiation process we observe, and then they can emit in gamma rays. The TV emission could be somewhere around here, and that this is with um, uh, the Vera Rubin um, um, uh, telescope would be giving or receiving input from us. This is the two in, the two regions in which we expect uh, a good synergy, and in the case for so when we speak about uh, cosmic rays, basically we speak about relativistic electrons or heavier nuclei. In the case of relativistic electrons, um, the, 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 the main channel to produce gamma rays is inverse Compton. There is also the Stralun and other channels that were mentioned before, but they, the main channel that we are seeing in, in, in galactic sources is inverse Compton, in which basically you have rel relativistic electrons up scattering to very high energies soft photon fields and the soft photo fields they are actually falling in the from the optical to the far infrared region so for us it's really important to know the target to understand what's going on in the electron spectrum this in this quantum basically only depends on the electron spectrum and the and the soft photon field so knowing one of the the ingredients is fundamental to know what's going on on the on the source then you also have this other competitive emission, which is hadronic. I will I, I would spend less time here because hadronic basically you have heavy cosmic rays interacting with matter in the in the in the field of view. You have some secondary emission going around here, but in principle, this is not so important as to know really the soft photon field. So let me just um, go a bit on the sources and trying to 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 explain um, what I think could be the, the most important uh, synergies between ALSST and CTA. And let me remind you there is a focus group in synergies on the LSST and CTA, um, actually updating all these cases and working on this and trying to get a, a fluid um, com conversation between the two collaborations. This is coordinated by Filippo, which I believe he would be giving a talk. So I. I encourage you to go on and see what he has to say. Um, but let me just talk a bit on, on this kind of sources. I might start with pulsars. Pulsars um, is one very is, is, is potentially very, very important for CTA. Up to now in the in the Cherenkov main, we have like uh, less than well, like three, four, five uh, pulsars in the uh, uh, pulsed emission coming from neutron stars. And I just put here, this is a specific model by Hardy and Italian collaborators. I just wanted to show the kind of uh, spectral energy distribution we see from these guys. This is the, the for instance, this is for Villa, and this is the, the light, the phasogram of the light curve in phase in the radio, optical, X-ray, and gamma rays. And in gamma rays, what we start to see, you, you basically have the synchrotron peak going to the GV regime that we may be able to reach. But more important that we start to see a second component again on this inverse quantum scattering. And this scattering is happening in a region of, of, of soft photons that are in this kind of region, which is what we give a, a very, uh, when we find uh, the, the input from, from optical and infrared uh, detectors. So this is clear um, uh, an important synergy for us. Um, you can also look at these pulsars when they are in, in gravitational bounded to, to, to a massive star. And this is many of the objects that we see in binary or modulated emission in gamma rays. They are pulsars um, rotating around um, a massive um, stellar object. 
like this case here that I showed in the top right um, um, image. And then what was very important for us is to know what's the companion star, what is the characteristic of the companion star and how is the, this, this star evolving because it really changes the, the, the kind of emission that we detect in the gamma rays. And this is again another spectral energy distribution in which you see this is also again a bit complicated because this com this this objects are so complex that you have photon fields that can come from the corona, from the disk, or from the uh, from different parts. And this is what we see. This is for um a very, one of the strongest uh, binary gamma ray binaries that we see, and we call it gamma ray binaries because they they kind of the spectrum kind of peak in the gamma ray in the sub gamma ray, but in the in the in the in the optical emission, we the, the whole the whole emission is is actually dominated by the star, and this is for us very important. Um, not only this kind of objects, the gamma ray binaries, we also have things like Eta Carina, which is two very massive stars going around each other. This is the light curve from Eta Carina, and we also expect gamma rays. Uh, I mean, expect and, and we have detected these gamma rays coming from the interaction between the shock of the two winds. And this is something that we really need to have a good monitoring of how this optical emission is, 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 is evolving so we can understand what's happening in the gamma ray belt. Um, those are the, like the most uh, traditional, if you want, uh, gamma rays uh, binaries, but we can also, uh, we also expect to have uh, gamma rays in CTA coming from, from more stream binary system, like like um, microquasars, or, or for instance, in the case of microquasars, this is a, a, a nice work by, by Cancer et al. And this is here again, uh, the, the, the kind of emission that we expect, this is where CTA will be. And then again, we need to know um, how the, the, all the different corona discs uh, and the star, how the, 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 the soft photon phase is changing, so we can understand what's going on here. And we know that this transitional behavior that we see in the skies are related to instabilities in the disk or the jet ejection, and all that can be sampled looking at the optical emission, counterpart of emission. This is one example from microquasar. Another example I wanted to mention is um, um, millisecond pulsars, like we call it the black widows. And in the black widows, this is here, for instance, the, the optical light curve of 1959, very famous guy. And then you see how they the modulated is actually changing also. And we see also the counterpart in the GV, and we expect to see this kind of guys uh, in the CTA too. So beside this, this binary and pulsar, there is something else that we want to, we need uh, basically uh, access to counterparts um, to understand population, to understand the, 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 the steady emission coming from this guy here, put a picture of the LMC. Uh, the large Magallan in the cloud, in which we have a, a in in the color. This is emission, an image from Hess, and the in the in the overlight, um, and on the on the background you see this uh, emission from 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 the, 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 the optical emission in, in the B band. But what I wanted to convey here is that we we have a as as, may, as, as Antonio mentioned before, we have a very large uh, we have a large field of view, and but our our angular resolution is not that good. So we really need uh, to understand what's going on on the other wavelengths to, to, to identify what we are seeing in the TV. And that accounts for young supernova remnants and both supernova remnants, and also for cluster stars, in which we need to know all the photon fields around it to understand what's going on. And also to identify many of these large uh, sources that we observe that we don't know what they are originated from. That also accounts for pulsar wind nebulae, which is the, um, the basically the largest known uh, population of galactic sources in the gamma ray astronomy. And we, we, we would like to have also the photon fields to understand what's going on and to understand if all these unidentified sources we see, they are actually pulsar wind nebulae. But there's not, in this particular case, there's also, um, there's not just a steady emission that we would like to, to, to understand, but also transient, transitional behavior. So in the case, we have at least one, uh, one. One minute left. Okay, I'm, I'm almost done. Uh, 
we have uh, one case, it's the Crab um, Nebula, in which we actually see in the GV how the emission, the, the, the nebula is, is flaring. I mean, we have a lot of um, uh, um, um, uh, transitional events. So there's nothing else in any other wavelength, and this is something that's very, uh, like, like, we really need multi wavelength imaging. And the last thing that I want to just mention is galactic transients. And in, 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 I think it's important to mention Novi. Novi is one of the most uh, relevant sources right now. It's a very, it's the first one has been detected only this year, or well, last year. And then we were actually able to see the, 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 the shock as it was happening. And for that, we actually we, we really need a good multi wave um, covering and that kind of show, for instance. This is one uh, particular model that I just put here just to show the emphasize, to, just to emphasize how important it is to understand what's going on in each of, by looking at the different, um, at the different uh, wavelength, then you see what's going on or where the shock is passing through. And in fact, what we actually see is here is the optical. Uh, alert, and this is the, the GV uh, in the Fermilab alert, and then we see a few days later how the GV comes, and that is really, really important to understand this shock that we can see uh, as it occur in time result. So I just took this 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 picture from, from Francisco Foster, and then uh, I found interesting that the, the, the this is um, the things that we are seeing now is this kind of upper layer, the upper layer with the current telescope and with CTA, we have to move into this. It has to think that we, we are of the other hundreds of sources or less than 100 source, galactic sources. And we pretend to move into a larger sample with CTA. This is a simulated galactic plane survey, uh, the inner part, and then you see how many, many sources we're gonna see. And we are gonna also sample the whole galaxy. And this is, we, we, we expect to have a large amount of, of not just steady emission, but also transitional emission. And coming back to the, to the group, the CDA LSST synergy, I'm not going to ask you to read this because it's really small. I just want to tell you that there is a lot of activity in this, in this part. And of course, in the galactic part, you can see how many people, the people are working in what's the, the, the observation cadence we need, what is the kind of product that we want to uh, uh, interchange and so on and so forth. So please, if you're interested in these things, just contact this, these guys here and then get involved with, you know, to work with us. And probably I'm out of time. So I just leave you here with these two plots in which I just want to make sure that you, this, this is just telling us this is something that Valentina did for, for looking at transitional, what is the improved in transitional behavior. This is something um, Tony already explained, but this is the number of uh, sources that we expect to, to, to detect with CTA when, is it, when the work when is, is, is finally online. And that's it. So I'll take some questions if you have any. Thanks a lot for listening. Okay, thank you, Emma. If there is a if there is a very quick question from here in the audience or on Zoom, okay. So you are really waiting for lunch. <laughs> so if you want to continue the discussion, uh, you can join the uh, Slack channel. Uh, thank you. Thank you, the speaker again. So our last presentation. Uh, if the speaker can uh, upload the presentation. Oh, me... It's gonna so... be by uh, Catherine Egberts. And the talk is on synergies with other instruments, the transient handler of the Cherenkov Telescope Array Observatory. Please go ahead, thank you. Exactly. Thank you. And yeah, I, I would also like to start with thanking the organizers to give me this opportunity to uh, uh, talk about uh, the synergies that CTA has and in particular then also present our work on, on the transients handler. So this presentation will be um, a little bit complementary to what we heard 
before from Antonio and Emma, uh, because I will not talk about the science cases that we've just got uh, presented in a very nice way on the extra galactic and the galactic sky. But I would like to go more into the details of really our, our synergies in the context of multi-wavelength, multi-messenger physics. And uh, then in particular, when we are talking about uh, very short time uh, time scales uh, to show you how how this is done um, and how how we we plan to to do this how we we plan to implement this with cta so i i can profit from from the nice introductions so um you have you have already heard this what uh, we will do with CTA, the Trankov Telescope Array. CTA will measure the uh, very high energy range of a broadband spectrum, as you can see it here for the case of the, the Crab Nebula. And we will really focus on this highest energy range. But uh, in fact, of course, there's, there's much, much more to cover here. And uh, we, are, we are talking of non-thermal sources. And CTA, the strength of CTA will really be its, its excellent sensitivity and the angular and, and energy resolution at this, uh, at this very high energy regime. And uh, so if we are talking of synergies, what, uh, what, what do we need? What can other instruments uh, provide? And what is, what is crucial for us is basically the two things. One is regarding this broadband spectrum. Of course, what we want to, to really, we want to understand the radiation as good as possible. So in order to characterize the radiation process, we want to, well, get uh, as complete as possible uh, a picture of this uh, component throughout all the different wave bands. And at the same time, we want to know more about the sources because also here our, we, are, we are rather limited. We want to learn more, for example, about object classes, about geometries, about uh, the, the environment of objects, distance, redshift determinations, information like that. And if we now go through this spectrum and we are talking of radio observations, I, I have to say this, uh, I, I will always give a few examples, but this is in no way exhaustive. It's basically impossible in the, in the era of multi-wavelength, multi-messenger, uh, observations. There are so many instruments that it's, uh, I can just give you yeah, just a few examples of uh, what, is, what is possible there and what kind of instruments will be, uh, will be providing input to CTA. Now radio has been basically the, well, the regime where we, we have for, for the longest times really observed non-thermal emission. In, uh, Emma has shown this in this synchrotron peak where we see primary uh, primary electrons electrons that have acceler have been accelerated directly or secondary electrons electrons that have been produced by primary uh, protons in or hadronic cosmic rays in interactions and with radio observations of course we have the strength of excellent angular resolution so we can learn a lot about the geometry just see as an example here this beautiful image of, of meerkat in the galactic center but we get also a lot of other information from radio observations that we uh, well, that we that we need to really understand the sources and and what is happening there. Few examples are pulsar timing or magnetic field constraints from further rotation, and also from the radio regime we have uh, where we get a more, a more good understanding of of uh, for example molecular clouds clouds our source environment. When we are moving up in energies, we we have here, I mean, this is classically, this is for the regime of thermal emission. So we can, we can have here the non-thermal part of the spectrum. This is, um, well, probably it's, it's particularly interesting at uh, the higher end here, because here we are probing the same particle population as we are doing with uh, CTA for the case of the inverse Compton scattering. But um, also from the, from the thermal emission, we can really learn a lot from here and uh, 
A few examples are, for example, the, the redshift from, from line emission. This is something um, crucial for us because, uh, well, from a non-thermal spectrum, you can see this, that there, there are no lines. So for us, this is simply not possible to, uh, to determine these redshifts. And it is, of course, a crucial ingredient if it then comes to really understanding what is, what is going on in these, uh, in these objects. And the other thing that I would like to highlight here is uh, the role of uh, transient factories. So as soon as you have wide field monitoring, this, uh, this allows uh, to, well, for us, it means we can receive input on high emission states. Now, Antonio has already explained that uh, CTA, the, the field of view is, is rather limited. So we do need instruments to, to trigger us, to tell us something interesting is going on there. So if you have high optical emission states, this could be something interesting to, um, yeah, for example, uh, to, to follow up with or for, for AGN observations to see if we have, if we can observe an AGN flare there. When we move on to X-ray observations, X-ray observations is, uh, well, it's, it's a similar thing in the moment that you have a wide field monitoring, you can trigger on transient phenomena. Also X-ray information is really interesting whenever it comes to um, the measurement of uh, thermal plasma properties. So this is the energy regime where we can, where we can measure that. And then high energy gamma rays, there we have the, uh, the Fermi satellite. Uh, high energy gamma rays is now interesting because you see here in the, the Krebs spectrum, we see this transition from uh, the inverse Compton to the, oh, sorry, from the from synchrotron to the inverse Compton regime when we are talking of electrons, or we can, uh, we can maybe identify here in this rise, whether this is uh, hadronic or leptonic nature in, in the shape of this transition here. So that we can look for a pion decay signature as we would expect it from, from hadronic cosmic rays. Interesting is also that here we can already have overlap with CTA, which allows for cross calibration. And again, we have the possibility of triggering on transient phenomena. Then finally, when we come to the, to the highest energy, so this is in principle the energy regime where CTA is, is going to measure, but um, at the same time, there are a few wide field of view instruments. So I've uh, named here LASO and the SVGO. And uh, these instruments do not only allow us to measure the maximum energy of hadronic accelerators, but they also have the advantage of A, having larger duty cycles and B, wide field of view. So this uh, allows for better time coverage. And again, the point about triggering on transient phenomena. Two more synergy instruments uh, or synergy categories I have. One are neutrino observations. So neutrino observations give us an additional um, input on the radiation process in the way that uh, neutrino observations with neutrino observations, we can distinguish between um, well, our, our two possible channels at the very high energies, uh, namely the inverse Compton compared to uh, the pion decay from uh, interaction of protons with gas. Uh, and uh, only in, in, the, in, the, in, this, in, this, uh, in this case, we will observe neutrinos. And this is something that is, of course, particularly uh, intriguing for us because it's, again, a discrimination that we can't do. At the same time, this is, uh, it, it keeps repeating itself. We, uh, neutrino experiments have a, a wide field. So you can, you can have triggers on these neutrinos and hope that the neutrino can, uh, can have come from, a, for example, a flaring, AGN, and then you can catch up this and, and try to correlate the neutrino emission with such a, uh, such a flaring AGN. The last synergy is, of course, gravitational wave observations, something rather new. And uh, gravitational wave observations, this is uh, particularly interesting 
uh, because it's, it has basically nothing to do with all these radiation processes that I was talking before, uh, but it really gives us uh, well, a, a purely, uh, well, a, a purely, purely geometrical information on the, on the masses and the geometrical properties and uh, on the object classes. And uh, then uh, we can then with CTA and of course all other wavelengths complement this with uh, the electromagnetic picture. Now these are was just a very fast going through the different different possibilities of what we have with synergies. And um, now <laughs> I would like to come to the point that I that I mentioned now a few times when I said we, we can these instruments can trigger us. And uh, the interesting thing here is that there are some phenomena where really timing is, is critical. So this plot is also something that Antonio has already shown and uh, Emma as well. It shows our sensitivity versus time where you can see that here on a scale of something like 10 minutes, we have four orders of magnitude um, better, better sensitivity than for example, the Fermilat instrument. And this means we can have, well, excellent uh, an excellent sensitivity on very short time scales but we need to know that something something time critical interesting is actually happening and here we have the problem of cta being a pointed instrument with a limited field of view we need an efficient triggering mechanisms from outside we need to receive this information this information from other instruments and then uh, can can follow up on this now when we're doing this we have to, this is basically the phase space that we have. We have the time scale of the phenomenon. So when we're talking of very long time scales, of course we have no problem because we have all the time of the world to point at something and look at it. Uh, when we're talking of short time scales, like a uh, well, few seconds or something, things get more complicated. And then the other important coordinate is how accurate is the localization precision that we have for certain for certain triggering events. So if we have a, a very accurate position, we can point to this and observe if uh, the localization precision is of the order of few degrees and larger, we are limited by by our field of view. So if you if you want to look at it this way, this is kind of the, the phase space that we can probe with imaging atmospheric Trankov telescopes. Um, we can either detect something by chance, this is this, this purple area, or if we really want to follow up on something, um, we need either rather accurate information on short time scales, or we have to do some, some tiling, for example, if we have a very large gravitational wave um, localization uncertainties. We can do some, some tiling. We can also do some fancy stuff like including additional information from galaxy catalogs and do some, some correlation with this so that we can find optimal pointing positions and then basically cover this, this localization position with time. But this of course takes some time until we have we have observed this. So how this is how how this uh, this increase here is explained. Okay, so the instrument that is doing all of that is the, uh, the CTAO transients handler. The transients handler is, is the instrument that we're basically that receives all of these information, all of these alerts from different instruments, like for example, from Vera Rubin Observatory, from gravitational waves, from neutrinos, um, GRB alerts from, from Swift, Fermilat, whatever. <laughs> it receives them, it processes and filters them, and then initiates observations. And this is done the following way. So this is uh, this uh, such a, um, a rather technical description. It is uh, the transients handler is part of the area control and data acquisition system in CTA, and it has basically the, the well, its job is to receive external alerts as well as internal alerts. So it's, it's also, we have a real-time analysis running. And if they see something interesting, they can still, they can also trigger us and say, well, 
look at this. Is this, is this something we want, we want to follow up on? We want to continue observing in this direction. And um, we receive these alerts and we then match it with science configurations. Now, Antonio already said we are, um, we are an observatory. So we have observation proposals. These observation proposals are then converted into science configurations. And if we receive an alert, what we are doing is basically a matching to check if this alert that we receive is something that is in our observation proposals that is worth following up on. And uh, this can be even, even more, more complex. We can do several, uh, several calculations, as I will show you in a moment. And then a follow-up decision is made and passed on to the CTA short-term scheduler. So this is these are our our sorry our we have a one or two minutes left. Mark. Yes, that is that is okay. I am I'm almost done. No worries. Um, we have basically we have three components in this transient handler. We have the broker system that receives all the alerts, external as well as internal. And uh, well, what is what we are currently doing is we have uh, we currently have. Uh, only well, we are currently only reacting to to gravitation. Sorry, to, to gamma ray burst events uh, using the O event to uh, the 2.0 uh, with Comet. But uh, this will, will will be expanded in the future, and the broker system will also be responsible for broadcasting CTA information to the outside world. Then, once we receive the information, this matching will happen with our observation proposals. And here we can also fold in, for example, additional catalog, uh, in additional information like uh, source catalogs, for example, as I mentioned for this tiling for, uh, for gravitational wave follow-up observation. And to speed up in the case of a lot of, um, lot of alerts, we will use parallel processing for this. And then the last part will simply be to pass this on to our short-term scheduler, uh, notify our human operator, and the support astronomer. And well, the current status of this is that we are currently in the in the phase of integrating this together with the Arcada software in the uh, LST1, so the first uh, large-scale telescope that uh, is already taking data on uh, La Palma and uh, the course of next year we'll have the first, hopefully, the first um, test observations taking data with this. And with this, I would like to come to my conclusion. And uh, well, I, I hope I showed you that CTAO will have um, synergies with, with many instruments and um, <coughs> we, will, we will rely heavily on input from other wavelengths and also from 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 other from other messengers and um, yeah these these instruments and uh, co combining these measurements will significantly boost the scientific return of uh, of CTA observations and whenever it comes to well, time critical observations the transient handler is is the instrument that will uh, that is yeah producing automated follow-up decision based on, on alerts that come in. And therefore is the, the interface between other facilities and, and CTA and will hopefully enable uh, the CTA multifaceted science program that is dedicated to the transient universe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine. Okay, if there is uh, one very quick question here in the room. Yeah, if you can please come. Okay, now we have the, the mic. Hi, thank you for your very clear presentation. I just want to ask you if, he, if there is already um, an idea of what, what kind of information would be in the alert scheme uh, or or if um, I may, you know, like miss it to the um to the presentation so what is my is uh what are what is the what are the informations that uh, are planned to be the alert scheme you mean from the alerts that we receive or that that we yeah. send out 
Uh, no, the, the one that it will be sent out. Um, there are there are discussions ongoing. Uh, I am. I mean, what what is currently discussed is sharing, for example, the uh, uh, the full CTA schedule with uh, with other facilities. Like what what we are currently observing, certainly there will be also a part that will be um, if we have. Um, I don't know if if we if if we if we, if we detect something uh, that is interesting for the, for the community to use this channel to um, yeah to to automatically without any delays uh, pass this on to to the outside world, but uh, the details are really not not yet decided. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank Catherine, and so let's thank all the speakers again. Okay, so have a, have a good lunch and see you on the Slack channel. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.